Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, my friend Anna. Your Excellency, my friend Augusto Nardes. Your Excellency, the President of ENAP, the National School of Public Administration. The Secretary of Internal Control, Mr. Gustavo. The General uh, Secretary of the Presidency of the TCU, and Mr. Paulo Vici. Mr. Ministro Ribas, uh, Minister Ribas Torres, Mr. Fábio Granja, the, uh, the General Director of this, uh, this uh, agency, and all the other secretaries, organizers of this very important event, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great joy that I would like to greet all of those present here to the fifth edition or fifth version of the International Seminar on Data Analysis when it comes to public administration. Welcome to you all. For me, it's a great joy to open up this event, whose organization uh, is a fruit of the partnership that the TCU has with the CGU and the National School of Public Administration in API. We also count on the support of the Innovation Network for the public sector in Novogov and also the International Cooperation Agency, the German International Cooperation Agency, the GIZ. On behalf of all of the organizers, I would like to thank you for your presence and to thank those who are following up the event on YouTube. And I would like to greet the foreign participants that are going to have a web link uh, to the simultaneous translation in English. I would also like to mention the delegation, the presence of the delegation, the Latin American organization, Ola CEFs. Uh, with representatives of 15 countries, and I truly hope that you're going to have a fruitful event of events here at the Institute. The seminar aims to promote the sharing of experiences and good practices related to the use of data analysis as an instrument to improve the management and the control of the public government agencies and also public policies. Our society is going through an accelerated process of transformation, not only in Brazil, but all over the world. Nowadays, we have on, on our hands uh, lots and lots of information, technological resources that boost us to change, innovate, or at least to adjust ourselves to the new times. This reality also applies to the way the public agencies operate and the people who work in them. And this seminar is going to give us the opportunity to get to know important advances that are already working well in other organizations. We know that many of Many people still see this as something that is related to the future, but the fact is that the future is already here, and maybe the benefits are here too. Many are the issues that the government has to face, and the use of data and information and technology is capable of helping in, uh, us and a lot and help the country of dealing with its greatest challenges. Many relevant work for our society are developed here at the TCU and in many other public agencies, uh, and ENAPI is one of them. But they are not seen by the media, and the society at large does not get to know about them. To be brief, I'm going to share only two of the diverse cases that we have gone through at the TCU and has made us feel optimistic and have convinced us that we are on the right path. Our Labor External Control Secretariat has developed a predictive model so that we can classify the risks of fraud when it comes to labor leave or labor insurance payments. The results obtained by this project indicate that it's possible to select criteria and prioritize actions that are going to reduce the risk of payments of irregular benefits. 
Another example that is very successful was the Alice robot. It was built uh, uh, from a partnership between the TCU and the CGU, and it allows the auditors and the users of the agencies being informed of irregularities in public biddings and also public notices on the same day they are published. And nowadays, we're now implementing the National Alice Project and it's done by the state TCU, the, the, uh, the state and municipal audit courts, and it's going to uh, extend its application to almost all of the public biddings. So these experiences are going to uh, transform realities and redefine efficiency levels. But this is only going to happen when it's used in a smart way, in a harmonious way, and involving all the people that work with this. Besides that, success works side by side with cooperation, and that's why we are here. An active partnership multiplies the possibilities and concretizes uh, intrinsic potentials of technological tools. That's why the seminar that is free and collaborative is a way to disseminate our best practices, share experiences and results that many times they encompass the efforts and similar problems and they, they found a, a common solution. During this event, many cases are going to be presented to us, both national and international, and the effective use of technology so that the governments can work effectively. We have speakers from over 20 different organizations, and I would like to highlight the following. The fire department of the state of Minas Gerais, and they are going to show with data analysis how it was used to facilitate the location of the victims of the the dam breaking in Burmajim and also the Kaima laboratory from Israel, they're going to talk about uh, how better to design public policies based on behavioral, behavioral modeling. Please enjoy the program and interact with one another, create connections that are going to allow you to make your work more effective. I believe that the creation of innovative solutions via technology is essential for the evolution and improvement of the public agencies. We need to develop new ways to work, always aiming at a better meeting the demands of our citizens. And if we do this, I'm sure that we're going to contribute to have a fairer society and a better society and a, a society we dream of. Thank you very much and welcome to all. So now we would like to invite onto the stage the president of the National School of Public Administration, Mr. Diogo Godinho Ramos Costa. We would also like to invite the Federal Secretary of Internal Control of the CGU, Mr. Gustavo de Queiroz Chaves. I would like to pass the floor to the Federal Secretary of Internal Control of the Office of the Comptroller General, Mr. Gustavo de Queiroz Chaves. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to greet Your Excellency, the President of the TCU, Mr. José Múcio, and I would also like to greet Minister Anaheis, Mr. Nargis, and all the other authorities present here today. And I would also like to greet all of the speakers, all of the participants, the participants of this international seminar. 
So the words mentioned by the president of the TCU, they reflect how important this event is from a public perspective and for those who already work with data analysis so that our society and our government can benefit from this. Mainly the TCU, the CGU, and receiving the support of our National School of Public Administration, ENAPI. In order not to repeat how relevant technology is and the impact it has in the reinvention of our governments, we also have the need to see the way you can use these new technologies, the professional zeal that is always going to be important when it comes to the publications, when it comes to the use of data, data sciences. I'm going to try to explain myself a little better. Every time we use models so that we can uh, make our uh, decision making, we are going to understand the relevance and the limitations of the data. And this is very important. It's important for us as researchers and also users of data science tools to make decisions, to decide everything in a very comprehensive way. Because many times decisions on how to allocate, how to use public policies, they're gonna be made uh, based on predictive models, forecasting models, that to a certain uh, extent, they need the entire amount of information. When it comes to control, Usually, we see the need of analyzing decisions made based on the results. So we do that after the, the policy is implemented. And the information is extremely important when we take into consideration our legal framework that we have at the federal level. And we have Law 3655, and it is worried that sanctions, punishments, fines based on wrong decisions, they must be deep when it comes to the liability and responsibility of those involved. involved. And so I would just like to add all of the points uh, mentioned by President José Múcio. The tools are very important. The tools are very important. So the data science tools are needed. We need to reinforce the use of these tools so that the researchers and the people who work with this, they can bring to us uh, comprehensive information with all of the limitations, but as completely as possible, because sometimes the people who make the decisions, they are not the ones using the tools, but they need information to make correct decisions, to avoid making incorrect decisions based on incomplete information. I would like to greet all of the organizers of this event. I would like to uh, greet all of the organizations that support this event. And as it has already been said by many researchers, we are now working with a new petrol or new oil. So the federal government and the state government and the municipal government, they have the greatest and largest databases in Brazil. And we need to bring the, uh, this information to the federal level. And so I would like to congratulate the organizers of the event. I believe that this event is going to more and more bring to the discussion, the discussion of new tools, innovations that are going to be able to improve the public management and also how we can invest our public resources better and invest it in the Brazilian society. I congratulate you all. Have a good event and have a wonderful success on these three days to create partnerships, to establish synergy, to make connections. And thank you very much. Now we hand the floor to the president of the National School for Public Administration, Diogo Gundinho Ramos Costa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to greet Minister Múcio and 
secretário Gustavo Chaves, also greeting Ms. Uh, uh, it is uh, for us at ANAP is a great opportunity to participate in this partnership and talk about this discussion, this heated discussion regarding the impact of that analysis in the public service. Increasingly, we see that the strength of new technologies is not something for us to look at the future, but also for us to understand and adapt to it in the present. In 2004, a Dutch photographer, Jan Benny, he took a series of uh, photographs called bureaucracy. He went to uh, dozens of countries, uh, taking photographs of bureaucrats in their offices, uh, uh, civil servants in their offices. And it's fun, it was interesting to see that then, in that time, we could see the effect of digital, digital transformation since uh, places uh, such as India, where they have uh, basically a person, a pen, a stamp, and a piece of paper. And uh, until the, the UK or Australia, where you could see less paper and more uh, computer screens and laptops. One of the most visible effects of digital transformation is the digitalization to remove paper and to use uh, screens and pixels. The second, it's less visible, but it's more sensitive, is the automation. It's when the work of that bureaucrat who is stamping, using his stamps, uh, becomes an online process, and this work is done by the machine, not a, not a human being. And the third one that is, is when you see that bureaucrat and that function that was repetitive, systematic, systematized and scalable is uh, completely done by computers. So the, the profile of the bureaucrat changes. It's not just someone who makes uh, stamps. They, it's a decision-making person and a provider of services. In this transformation, we see increasingly the capacity building work. An app presents uh, itself as a helper of the public service to bring capacity to the civil servant of the future, the person who will have new abilities and will uh, perform new roles. When you look at the technology panorama that will affect all that is in fact the activities, we have to look at that really carefully. The effects are still unseen unpredictable. We were looking at the uh, natural processing, lang uh, natural language processing. It's one of the uh, topics of, of the panels at GPT-2. And something, something that I read about it, and not only reading about that, but we, we also we have a query and then the language generates a poem or a cake recipe or the results for a soccer game or a story in the style of a certain writer. But one of one of the things that, uh, that I called my attention was the criti criticism to the language, that the language was not a better translator than the Google Translate. If it translate from English to French, it's still really poor. But the language programmers, they were surprised because they said that the language was not done for translation. There was nothing to do to teach the language to translate. When it was requested to translate, as they put thousands of books and encyclopedia texts, books, and they had translations from port, from English to French, and they went to those examples, and from those examples, they tried to generate a new translation. One of the most impressive things of this new context that we live today is our lack of capacity to foresee the results that will be generated by this and then countries that are in the, the peak of the digital transformation in, in the activities of control and prevention against risks they have new measures that are extremely important recently we see in singapore and one of the measures that they were really proud of 
was the new uh, guidelines for the use of algorithms in the, in the public service, transparent algorithms and algorithms that, algorithm, algorithms that are understandable to the population for them to understand that they are not governed by black boxes, but in fact, to understand the purpose of the technology in their lives. So increasingly we have, we see uh, this role that has to be performed by the Brazilian state for the government to go through the uh, digital translation and has a uh, rate of productivity and effectivity for that citizen and also to be un uh, understandable, to be transparent, to be perceived by the common uh, citizen as something that adds value to them. In Japan, for example, they use algorithms for the health sector in which the population accepts it, this use of algorithms for decision-making processes, as long as they understand that, that they know that above the machine, there's a human being there that will be able to um, tackle any problem that may happen. The civil servant uh, will be able to make these decisions in the future as well. and we. You know, you can count on an app, our school, for capacity building uh, towards uh, digital transformation and data analysis, even programs that we're having, uh, such as the book boot camp that provide information regarding uh, programming so that this uh, new world will not be a black box for the citizens and for the civil servant. An app is at your disposal. And Congratulations for this event. Have a good have a great event. In this moment, we close the opening panel. We will ask the members of this panel to occupy their seats on the first row of this auditorium so we can continue our program. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to have your attention now to watch the institutional video of the Federal Court of Accounts. In this space, a new possibility. Organizational learning. Information management and knowledge management. Research and innovation. Cultural management. Planned and modern facilities. Specialized library. Open to the public. Continuing uh, enhancement of the external control and public administration. Development of technical competences. Personal skills and leadership. Post-graduation. <laughs> Call 
collaborative constructions high studies center culture art the court of accounts to continue the activities we would like to invite the in, in, the secretary for con external control of information of TCU Wesley Vaz he will pr provide the seminar of workshops and organization general organization of the of the event good morning good morning again are you awake it's i know it's monday so please let's wake up thank you so much for everyone who is here for everyone who is watching this presentation on youtube around 200 people online i would like to thank our uh, foreign delegation have representatives of 15 countries welcome to Brasilia I would like to thank especially the ones who are here and who are who um, provided some type of uh, research work for this Congress without the this works we cannot uh, carry out this Congress and for the ones who didn't have their, their presentation uh, selected um, I would like to thank you anyway. This seminar is absolutely collaborative. Without collaboration, we just don't, cannot do it. And today, we are completing five years. So I will speak really briefly important things on how the three next days are going to work. First, uh, regarding the content, today and tomorrow, we're going to, hear, to have lectures in this auditorium. Uh, 20 lectures in the total. On Wednesday, we're going to have six workshops that will be carried out in the environment of the, of the Institute. There's an important question that has been asked for many people from uh, how to subscribe in the, in the workshops since the subscriptions are closed. We changed our organization compared to last year to improve the sensibility of the workshops. And today at 1 p.m., the link for subscription in the workshops will be available. Obviously, the workshops are limited and the vacancies tend to finish quickly. But most importantly, if you have a vacancy in the workshop, you must be at the door um, of the, the room of the workshop uh, up to 15 uh, minutes before the workshop. If you're not there 15 minutes before, we're going to call people in the waiting list. Is that clear? All right. Regarding the breaks, in the two days, the two first days, we're going to have coffee breaks in the afternoon uh, shift, and in the lunch breaks, we're going to have the traditional food trucks outside. Uh, where we'll take the chance that the weather is really really pleasant, really cool. We have um, tables in, in, at, in the shades, so we can enjoy the, the, the weather in, of Brazil this year. If you're not from Brasilia, please, please drink water, hydrate yourselves, because we are in a desert uh, climate in this time of year, especially. The moment that we, are, we stop, I would like you to enjoy what's most important of this seminar, which is the talking exchanges. Meet people, get to know their works, exchange ideas on what they're doing, because this will be, I repeat, the greatest benefit of this work. So I spoke of the content, and it's important to highlight regarding the content that uh, parallel to this seminar, we're going to have the jail control 
it's a week from our Latin American uh, friends. So they will be present in some part of the seminar and uh, at the same time they will have their own activities. Regarding, I spoke of the content, about the breaks, and now I will talk about to giving equal opportunity for the ones who are here and the ones who are on YouTube. We're going to receive the questions only uh, through Twitter, Brazil, hashtag, uh, hashtag Brazil Digital. This is how you can send your question to Twitter and the organization of the event will verify the question and provide them to the speakers. The morning uh, lectures will be different from, from the other uh, the other ones. Uh, we have two lectures and the questions will be done at the end of the lectures. In the afternoon, we're going to have the format of panel. All right. I would like to reinforce my gratitude for you to be here for us reaching the fifth year of this event. And also I'd like to highlight that, unfortunately, we don't live a moment of celebration. As Lu uh, Minister Lucio said, we, we are living a um, tax crisis in Brazil. And this crisis demands creative solutions to have efficiency, effectiveness, and impact in, Brazilian st in the Brazilian state. It is absolutely necessary. I think that everyone who is here believes that the use of data analysis techniques can produce analysis and products. Why not? that will help in this efficiency and effectiveness. That's what we believe. But just to complicate the story a little bit, besides the crisis period we're living, we're living a moment of transition, of transformation, as our dear friends from CGU mentioned. So because of that, I think that the role of the professionals who work with data and information and technology needs to be valued and revised. Ladies and gentlemen, in this seminar, as the, the other seminars, real cases will be presented, and I really would like that we would question uh, the speakers of the effective results of their works, because that's what matters. Many times, uh, the ones we, the ones who work with information, we are such a we are mess messengers of things that nobody understands. Do you agree with that? How many of you had to speak to your clients and you couldn't communicate very well because they don't understand your language? We, the ones who work with data, we have a great challenge in this moment, which is to try to produce something with impact, considering the fact that, as the president of NAP mentioned, not everything that we produce is perfect and uh, intelligible for the ones who are going to use it. Sometimes you have to be ambassadors of bad news, such as this information that you use to make decisions doesn't have necessary quality. This that you always believe to be true is not true. Well, how can we deal with this? I dare to say that maybe the one we, the ones who work with data, we need to develop the technical competences, but also other competences, and I will mention two of them. The first one, the resilience and the courage to keep insisting on producing uh, cutting-edge technology to help our institutions. And uh, this group, it brings comfort for us because we are on the same boat. Second, our humility to understand that many times the response of our algorithms and our problems is are not with us, with us. They are with our clients who do not understand what we are saying. And third and last, our sense of ethics and commitment to somehow try to protect that which is our input protect personal information of Brazilians. Your algorithm must work really well and have access to everything. We are near uh, the action of a law of data protection, and we need to maintain that. We need to keep this right. So there is a lot of work uh, on, apart from developing machine models or extracting data and provide them to the organizations. 
you, the, your fundamental work must not be seen only in the technical uh, bias, but also the responsibility of the ones who will uh, perform this work, protect information, and produce the information, the technology that will have a better impact to the organizations. So there was an analogy that the data is the new oil or pe petroleum. I don't like this analogy too much. It was an analogy done by a British person that uh, data is the new water. And he tries to justify what? It must be fresh. It must be clean. It is the it in the center of our lives. And it has to be as abundant and clean as possible. That's why I, I put this video here behind me. That's why I believe that we have to change our perspective when it comes to what do we truly understand as data analysis in the federal governments or in the government. So when we talk about public agencies, try to make abundant what is lacking, try to make relevant what was hidden, try to make simple what was absolutely complicated. And I believe that this is one of the essential challenges that we have. And all of us who deal with data, we face these challenges. So I'm very happy to be here today because now I'm going to invite onto the stage. Well, I, I'm going to call Brazilian heroes onto the stage. Yes, people. So they appeared on the media as heroes, and they dealt with one of the major tragedies that happened in Brazil and shocked all of us. It was when the dam in Brumadinho broke up and uh, destroyed rivers and the environment and cities. And they are going to explain how in the middle of chaos, they used what they had within their reach to use to try to save people in a real situation and they didn't solve the loss problem, but they they helped some families. So I would like to invite onto the stage and I would like a round of applause for them, Colonel Elon Dias and also Lieutenant Fernandes from the Fire Department of the State of Minas Gerais. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For us, from the Military Fire Department of Minas Gerais, it's a great honor to be here. My name is Colonel Botelho, and here is Diego. Lieutenant is going to give his presentation after me. On behalf of our organization, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here to share a little bit with you what we are going through because the tragedy hasn't ended yet. This is uh, the, the 134th day of rescue and uh, search and rescue now in Minas Gerais. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the organizers of the event. And I truly hope to be able to share this experience with you that we're gonna divide in two moments. First, we're going to talk about the str strategies that permeate our operation, and Diego is going to discuss the data that, for us, we have been learning every single day, and we have been learning a lot. Allow me to stand, okay, because for me it's better. I, you can see me better, but visually you know that you can see me, even in the dark, because of this orange, this bright orange, right? So lately... I have been talking a lot about Brumadinho because since the 25th of January, in the first 40 days, I was there uh, every other day. And every Thursday, I go there so that we can revise our strategies. And so I am the head of the fire department, and we review and revise all of the processes. And so yesterday and the day before yesterday, we were surprised with the fact uh, that is very bad for us. Usually, our presentations about Brumadinho 
we always pay homage to the victims. And yesterday, and yesterday morning, I was calling a team of uh, a fire men in Amazon, in the Amazon. They are fighting against the fires there. They are helping our friends from the army. And we were talking about security and safety. And when I was traveling from Belo Horizonte to Brasilia, we received terrible news here in Brasilia. Yesterday, uh, soldier Marizelli died and she was fighting the fires here in the forest. And as Wesley said, it's not only Brasilia. Minas Gerais is burning up, Brasilia is burning up. And I have a dichotomy now and I'm trying to explain. I don't know if I want rains or no rains, because if there is rain, the fires go down. But if you if there is rain, the operations in Brumadinho are totally compromised. So I have this dichotomy in my mind now. So, and I have a picture of Marizelli and a few minutes of silence to pay homage to our colleague that uh, died during her job. And no, she's going to help us from heaven now. Thank you very much for this. And so I'm going to talk about the strategies for the Brumadinho operation. So nowadays, our biggest goal are these 21 pictures on the screen, 21 ju uh, pieces of jewelry, jewels. Every Wednesday, we meet with their families. They don't call them victims. They call them the jewels. So the jewels are the 21 objectives that we still need to achieve. So 21 people are still missing or they must be identified. And so if we think about percentage, many tragedies that we have seen and we have observed, so the number of people who are found after they die is about 80%. That's the average rate. And when it comes to statistics, 80% is really high. We have already found 92% of the victims, but our main objective is finding, finding the 21 pe people that are still missing. This is our main goal. This is our main focus. And we have to try to find them in the time that we still have. And so I'm going to contextualize the situation for you. And this has been teaching to us everything that is different from one incident to the other. So this is a river. This river is called Feijão River. And so it shows how the dam broke up. And so, so it was under the dam. It didn't give any warning. The risk of that dam was considered very low, but it uh, happened. And so we needed to sue this phenomenon. What happened? So on the 25th of January, it broke, it uh, exploded or was damaged. Uh, and, and so we got there, we implemented our command and control center. And at the first moment, it was very complex. And so the main idea uh -huh. I, I, I got in touch with our uh, aerial command and I said, what is the scenario? Well, we have an aircraft, it flew over, so the dam burst and it uh, destroyed everything that was that belonged to the company called Vali. And so we didn't know how many people, we didn't know, and this was the situation there. This was the situation. I'm going to try to show. On the right-hand side, you have the dam that burst, yes? And way there on the left-hand side, we have a water dam that is intact. And it even offered risks during the, the entire time. It was a water dam. And walking to the effluent dam, it always showed to us that it was unstable. And then where you have here, the effluents, the waste here, and then it fell, and then it destroyed the entire structure of the Valley Company. And these are technical information that the company shared with us. The dam that burst, 
And so there was a construction of, it was a construction of 1976. It was a pretty old dam. And so we had many, many uh, improvements. And so what are these improvements or extra construction? And so the tailings increased, increased, and they had constructions, constructions, so that the dam could hold the tailings behind the, the main wall of the dam. But they weren't able to do that. And okay, so the size of the head of the the crest of the the, the dam, and this was the biggest challenge for us. And one of the things that have been changing, mainly from other events, and I would like to mention this, Mariana, Brumadinho is totally different from Mariana in terms of the tailing characteristics, in terms of the actions, in terms of the terrain, the region, everything that you can imagine was different from Mariana. So the tailings and the ways it was denser, heavier, and we needed to uh, assemble these places. We created a control and operation center inside a church, a church near the Feijão stream, and so also in the college. In college, we used to maintain or hold our strategic meetings. And basically, we had this scenario. So the dam burst, and 10 kilometers was uh, the, the waste and the tailings ran for 10 kilometers. And so since it was very dense, it stopped right here. This is the reality. So the waste got all of the administrative offices of Vali, the cafeterias. It went to the, the settlements. And now there's only a, a sign there because everything was destroyed. And then they created backwater there, backwater. And so I don't know if you can see it. There is a blue line here, and the blue line is a stream. It's a body of water that came uh, and uh, damaging our efforts, hurting our efforts, and still uh, compromising our search and rescue operations. So this is the reality, the reality, and so we developed our first strategy. What was the first thing? So search uh, everywhere, everywhere, be it with airplanes, aircraft, on foot. And so the area that you saw on the previous slide, it was completely searched superficially. And so on the crest, we had... We had over 30 aircraft uh, flying over, landing, taking off, okay, in the Confins Airport. And we had more of, uh, landings and takeoffs than any other situation. So 630 firefighters, over 30 aircraft. We used uh, small boats because the area was very in perfect, it was complicated, volunteers. So everybody wanted to go into the hot zone, and so it was important for us. And so we had to operate with the, the armed forces, and so the military firefighters, they were responsible for the hot zone, that stain that I showed you with all of the waste and tailings and the other stakeholders outside the hot zone, okay? Uh, machines only in as, uh, uh, only uh, on simple operations or something that we had to do focal in a, spe in a special place, yeah? And so we had many government agencies. We had Israeli forces helping us there. And so many people ask me, was it effective? The situation of Israel is a little dif different, but it was very important for us, mainly when it came to the technology and the planning that they have. And this week we had a conference with all of the Israeli delegation to discuss the good points and the bad points. So this was the first strategy. So this was our reality. Everything was 
liquid and the dogs were almost totally ineffective now and this is in operation with the Israeli forces we did what we could at that time and this was the uh, the initial phase after after 20 days, well, between 20 and 40 days, we already had the second strategy. We diminished the number of firefighters. We started using search dogs, and then we started searching for victims on foot. And over 15 states in Brazil, they they shared, they lent their dogs to us. And so it was not only a work of Minas Gerais, one aircraft, and we started using machines in specific places, specific places. And so we analyzed some constructions because we needed some intervention to carry out our operations. And so this is the scenario now. It's very dry now, as you can see. So this is the scenario that we had at that time. And so we went from a huge saturation moment to a reduction in the number of firefighters. We started using heavy equipment and what was different it was the use of search dogs and these are some pictures and so between the 40th and the 60th days what did we notice that was important so we needed to dig in more specific ways in specific places where the terrain was becoming drier so we started using trucks and equipment so we reduced the number of firefighters even more to 130 so the aircraft is not so important now so we went from 30 aircraft to 14 and then to one and this aircraft is there so so that we can preserve the fauna so that we can follow up the animals there and we started digging in dry areas and we started using the canine unit and we went from 10 canine units to four not because we wanted to no because we have used all of the dogs in brazil we have used all of the dogs in brazil that are trained to do this kind of search and i believe we're going to receive some dogs from the state of paraiba and they're going to help us out until the end of october and now we're planning how are we going to use more canine units because this is very important so that we can discard the 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 land that we dig. So using machinery, and there is a company responsible for this machinery. And so Vali, the company, would offer us the machinery and we would use it. We, ha we ha started using amphibious machines because even with this drought, there are many areas that are flooded. And so we have to use amphibious equipment. And after strategy number three, we are going to discuss something, and Diego is going to use this. We're going to use operational intelligence. We're going to get the data that we inserted into our systems, and we're going to create maps so that we can establish new strategies. So the, this, uh, these are the multi-criteria maps. We, get, we got data from cell phones, where some bodies were found, uh, radio frequencies, and we overlapped everything, those who work with uh, planning, and Diego is one of them, and we started determining, okay, the darker areas are areas that are more interesting for us, and I'm going to have a more effective search there. So that was the idea. And then we started developing the fourth strategy, that is search by uh, deepness, deep depth depth and so uh if it's 13 or 14 meters of tailings deep and so differently from bent rodriguez and mariana and on google you can find the tailings they came through and they covered houses and cars and so the density of these tailings took everything to other places and we started finding them so the main idea was to esta stabilize the number of firefighters. We have 138 firefighters, one uh, aircraft, and 111 ma uh, machines or equipment working at specific places. So this was strategy number four, and four K-9 units. 
and it remains the same. And so after day 60, uh, we, we started moving forward. But some effectiveness was brought to us, happened. But this concerns me. And this is the reality further on that we have to have integrated work with the civil police department. So we had a meeting at the coroner's office to understand, look, this is what we're finding. We're finding bodies, we're finding segments, and is this being effective? We were finding many segments or fragments of bodies, but they were re-identifications. So we had people who were cut into pieces and we found fragments of these people. And so this was rework. I'm not saying that this is not important, okay? But we needed to be more effective. And so uh, I like to show this slide for the following reasons. Above all that we know, and history shows this important dichotomy, it is the average of drought season in Minas Gerais. We have a uh, characteristic there is either we have rain or we have drought. So the fire fighters work in the floods and in the fires in vegetation. In the end of July, from the end of July until November, they are the, uh, the drought uh, month. That's great. So we have until November to work in Bernardino uh, with a reasonable easiness. Then we had the pluviometers that are uh, installed in Bermondeu, and we, we realized that in the past 20 years, historically, in Bermondeu, it rained uh, one month before. So what was 13, 14, 15 of November, it's actually 13, 14, 15 of October. So we, use, we, we would have two, three months, but actually we're going to have one month, so we need to intensify our work. This is our reality. So uh, the rainy seasons, as I mentioned, uh, it comes with this doubt in our minds. How can we advance? How can we go ahead? And more, more than one month ago, we developed the fifth strategy, and we are still on it. We are working on it, especially with some issues that uh, were uh, presented to us in that moment, which is the data that we collected through the teams that went to uh, the field, and we had a little notion notion of the situation. It is an analysis that we'll have to go through a refining uh, process, but us, we uh, who are working uh, directly in the field, we don't have enough time to wait for a certain data to be um, improved to make decisions. I will not speak empirically, but the way the data was shown, we realized that 92.36%, more or less, in what was registered were bodies or parts of bodies up to the this depth, three meters. And almost the totality of it uh, up to six meters. So the surge that until that moment was of depth and our time is running. We are working. Uh, we're going to work for one month with without rain to, to disturb the work. So we needed to scan the, the place that was not explored to improve the quality of what was found. So we started redefining the strategies. We used the same number of firefighters, the same number of fronts. However, we used um, the, uh, several uh, machines and excavation up to three meters. So the areas that were not had not been explored, we, we explored them. So the quality of what was found for identification improved. And however, it unfortunately didn't bring any new identification. But as soon as we, we started this strategy, it was even in the news, it was, I think, on uh, August 30th, we identified seven months later a body that was practically uh, entire. It just didn't have a leg, but it had the, the head. So this brought us the motivation 
uh, more motivation to have the definition of the strategies. So this is uh, the, the canine team. And it is, yeah, we have a deficiency uh, in the state. And we are even thinking of um, asking for other countries to help us on this. So this is the current strategy. And what do we have here? We have 130 firefighters working daily. It is a, uh, also a staff of 30 uh, officers and punctual excavations of up to three meters of depth in large areas. So these clear um, light areas are the ones that have not been uh, scanned uh, down to three meters from our team. So especially here, near the city of Brumadinho, this part here is Brumadinho, so near the community, and they would demand us a lot for this work, we started to do excavations here, uh, finding body parts, and the quality of the search was better. We had more re-identification than identifications themselves. So this is the, the strategy that we've been using until today. Uh, we will complete eight months of service without uh, a deadline for finishing. When, even, if, even if, when it starts raining, we're going to continue working. We're just going to realign the strategy. So if we have a specific uh, technique, uh, technical situation that prevents us from work, and then we will stop. But if not, we will continue. So this is the end of my situation. My, this is the end of my presentation. This is the, the current situation. We have 305 located people, a total of 270 uh, casualties, and 21 to be located. We are in the process of maturing of this strategy, and certainly in the next days, it will provide us some uh, security on keeping the work during the rainy season. So this is the strategic part. This is what we experience on a week basis, on a weekly basis. And I'd like to thank all the states that offered help to us. It has been an extremely exhaustive work and a work that we need to focus on safety in other aspects such as health and, and structures and just to wrap up uh, I would say that the firefighters work there until uh, 21 days they cannot be that longer to that because, because of the exposition to the tailings in Minas Gerais we had so far 200 uh, 2500 uh, firefighters from the state of Minas Gerais and there are other 400 from other states so the the total Personnel is, would be 6,000 people who have already worked. But our priority now is to find the 21 missing per, uh, people and solve this problem. So this is the first part of our presentation. Uh, I tried to go quickly because Diego is also going to speak to you. And he will bring information regarding the data. And then we're going to be available for questions and anything that can be presented. Thank you so much. How are you, everyone? My name is Diego. I'm a lieutenant of the firefighter department. We will talk about the data analysis itself. Well, many strategies were created, and many of them were based in the data analysis. I will talk about three specific ones I worked, uh, which I worked in. As the coronel said, we have a rotation uh, regime to avoid contact with tailings, and including the planning area and the management of the operation. So the first one we will discuss is the estimated depth. We I will talk about a map that we call a map of uh, projections and the map of heat. Initially, I bring this 
and the heat map. Here you can see the, the region after being um, reached by the tailing. So this is the before and after photograph. So this brings us the idea of, of thinking of the estimated depth of tailings could be an important data in, in the moment of designing strategies. Other whys on, why, on treating the estimated depth of tailings. That would be the most efficient operation for the heavy ma ma machinery uh, and the rotating regime. We have more information on the terrain we're working at, uh, and you have to remember that we have 20 fronts with three, four digging machines and six or seven um, uh, trucks. So it's really important to have the estimate, estimated uh, depth uh, of tailings. Apart from that, we understood that gener to generate this uh, data could bring more information that will be will be used to help uh, make decisions and create new strategies. How do you do we carry out this depth uh, estimate? We have two topograph maps, two with level curves, and before the breaking of the dams, uh, and another one that would be uh, the most recent possible. And we overlap these two maps. So looking at the level curves as a compound, we use the intersection of these curves to estimate the depth of the tailing. So the altitude of the most recent uh, map minus the altitude of the map prior to the breaking of the dam. So um, analyzing the le curve levels, we would uh, be able to understand, have an estimation of the depth of the tailings. Initially, we we had these two maps in that uh, data mining, and it generated an, uh, a file to Google Earth. So the of officers in field, they had a cell phone with, with GPS, and they could see both um, level curves. And uh, of course, they had a training to be able to identify both um, curves to, do the, to see the intersection of them and calculate the, the estimated depth of tailings. After that, to facilitate the handling of the tool, we started using um, the collector for ArcGIS. It is a more professional tool. The image is a little, is a little too light, but it adapts the amount of points to the zoom that you, that you give. So you still have the GPS localization in the map. Every three meters, they would have one point in which they identify the estimated uh, depth of tailings in each location. From this, we started to expand the use of the tool. In, instead of having only the estimated depth of, of tailings, we also included in, this, in ArcGIS Collector more information to have better access to the command of the operation. So if you are in the in, in field or outside the field, uh, the commanders had access to a whole array of information in, of maps, of Google Maps, for example. We have over 2,000 points distributed in, in several uh, layers. So we organized the information to have a better access and to make it easier for decision making. Now let's talk about one of the tools we created, which was the map called Projections. We tried to use a large array of information regarding the victims that were still missing to create a map that would help us generate more information to determine the areas of more probability of success. So initially, how did we do this database? This database was uh, one of the most was the most complex database of the operation. It had a very uh, a large um, pre-work, uh, interviews with military uh, personnel, and other data sources such as one of the most different information that we received was the position of the printers, the time 
that the worker of Val de Hudo's company asked to print certain information in a printer. So from this, we could suppose an initial position in the beginning of the, the, the disaster. We had several data inputs that generated hundreds of pages that were condensed in this map called projections. And apart from this report, the map received more information. So what was our, our result? What what is this map projections? Basically, we have a map that has the final position of people that possessed the same po initial position of the victims that were missing. So victims that we already found and parts of bodies of these victims, we had their final position. So we associated which of these body parts had the same initial position of victims that were still missing. Okay, so let's start talking about the map, um, literally a map, to generate more probability to find victims. This is the great challenge. We didn't have a theoretical ref reference, and I invite you all to support us in that matter. To use probability, um, stronger theoretical reference to say that in a certain place you would have more probability to find a victim. Given uh, in a scenario like this with so many uh, victims, it is rare. Another goal of the heat map is to optimize the placement of resources in the terrain. So two objectives that are connected to each other. First one, to understand where we would have more probability to find victims. And the second one is to be able to place the resources in a way to use this information properly. Before talking about the first criteria of this heat map, I think it's important to open a parenthesis. And the coronel showed the multi-criteria map that was used as an inspiration for the creation of the heat map. In this multi-criteria um, map, many data, uh, pieces of data were, were presented, uh, certain 900, uh, around uh, 900 points. And in the point of view of uh, case study, it has a lot of information, and it is very interesting. But unfortunately, it was made on June 20, May, uh, May 22nd, and it was not really being really uh, effective, bringing the, the desired eff uh, effects that we expected from the way it was built. So the heat map came as an, a different proposal to have fewer criteria. Instead of having a multi-criteria uh, map with many points, the proposal was to select criteria that would be more relevant for our search. So what we used as a criteria uh, initially was recently found body parts in the time that were, when the map was made. So around 25 days. I think the map was from May, uh, June 26th. The second criteria is, besides selecting the most uh, recent body parts, we would give different weights to these body parts. The ones that up to were found up to 10 days, uh, the ones that were found in uh, 20 days. So we would give a, a higher weight for the ones that were found more, more recently. And the last criteria was exactly to use the projection map, the map of the missing people, the map of the final position of the missing vis victims, I mean, the map of the final position of victims that had the same initial position as the, the missing victims. So that was the idea. Two points that uh, the assumption that we are, we are making this map is that if two bodies were in the same place before the breaking of the dam, after the breaking, if you find one, the zone around it 
around him or her would be the possibility of finding the other person. So this is our produce. It is the heat uh, map generated using this criteria. What is interesting about, about this map is that uh, in comparison to the multi-criteria map, it really prioritized a region. Can I have the laser point? This region was prioritized uh, compared to the, the former map, the multi-criteria map, in, in the absolute and in the relative way. The, the, the remaining of the map was less um, prioritized, and this region here was more prioritized in the map. In this region, seven days after the implementation of this heat map, we found one body in the region that was prioritized. And the body of August 30 was also in this region. So let's continue talking about the results of this heat map. So we had a reduction in the number of bodies that we were finding after, uh, throughout the months because of the nature of the operation. So initially, you would find the bodies on the surface, and then you started needing uh, backhoes and machinery. So it became more difficult to find the bodies. And from March, uh, we found 17 bodies. In April 6, in May, we only found one body, June only one. And so we were reducing the number of bodies found, and this was a natural process. But right after the implementation of the heat map, we found three victims within 15 days. And uh, we were just finding one victim a month in average before this heat map. And so, of course, we understand that this heat map is not perfect. I really enjoyed the presentation that was given before, showing that all of the strategies are limited when it comes to data analysis. And here are the proposals to optimize the tool that we are using already. One of the proposals uh, uh, respecting its assumptions is to constantly update it. So as this heat map was implemented using only the most recent body parts and that we should only use it with the most recent body parts. So ignore some of the past ones and add new body parts uh, that are going to have a higher weight here on the map. Uh, something else we need to update is the weights, the weighting. So the, the body parts that had a higher uh, weight as time went by, it's going to have a lower weight until it disappears completely from the map. And the body, mar uh, body parts of uh, this projections. So thank God we are finding the victims. So every time we find a victim, the victims that were related to that person, they are going to be removed from the projection map so that it can be fed once again into the heat map. And so the optimization of the heat map, we have been using GPS so that we can already analyze the area that we have covered and searched. So what are we doing nowadays? Every time we go to a certain place, so we are working in 20 different fronts, and we have backhoes, we have machinery, we have trucks. So every time we excavate a certain place, the lead, the leader is going to go there and use the GPS to mark the area that he worked on uh, on that day. So the main idea is to use this kind of information in the area, the area that, already be, that has already been searched. It's going to be inverse, inversely proportional to the weight of that area. And so the areas that we have already visited and we didn't find any body parts, it's going to have low priority, lower priority than the areas that have not been visited yet. 
and have and for example the area that was visited many times it's going to have a lower weight in our heat map and this is basically the idea behind the implementation of the gps so just to wrap up i would just like to mention this is an unprecedented operation so it's extremely complex it's an extremely large area, and I thank God because 92% of the victims have been found, even though we have only explored 10% uh, of the tailings. But I'm sure that we can still use data, data analysis, strategies, and there's no doubt in my mind that in such an operation, it's important to have multidisciplinary teams so that we can develop this kind of work. So all of the tools that I mentioned to you, all of them, they had the participation of somebody that was not a firefighter. So for all of those tools, we asked the technician to help us out. And so the trend of a certain demand and the use of software, and they helped us out whenever we requested anything. And for sure, we need more people to use these tools and also to think, to think about the operation, to plan the operation. So in practice, we have two or three firefighters to analyze the data, to propose strategies to our commanders, and also many times to analyze the data. So you're always trying to improve the collection of data. Sometimes you interview the families yourself and so the support from data and analysts is essential for us at the moment. So what are we interested in now? And they are very important for us when it comes to the data analysis. We have a wonderful uh, technical team. We need people who are experts in BI, ETL, data warehouse, so that they can collect our information, try to identify patterns, standards, jointly with the firefighters to determine which patterns are going to be more relevant for our search so that we can have better results. And I make my words uh, Wesley's words, that for all of the public managers that are listening to us, that it is essential for you to use data analysis as a base, a uh, foundation for your decision-making process. Analyzing the data, identifying vectors, the professionals who do this, they have to be valued and they must be heard. So I would like to compliment all of those who work with this now uh, here in the audience and who have been working with this for a, a long time. And it's a great honor to be here speaking to you. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have some questions on Twitter, but I'm going to ask some questions. So you called us, and this is very interesting. So uh, there is, I have a question. So the, these data are available so that people can help you. Are these data public? Are they available? So if we want to create a work team now and we want to start working with this, how can we help you? Well, they are not public. They are not open yet. There is security, data security involved here, but for sure we can work with professionals who are willing to help us out, as we have been doing throughout the operation. So we have many university professors who offered to help out. We have many engineers who work at Vale, the company Vale do Rio Doce. They have been made available to us, and also uh, 
from their hearts. They have come to us out of the blue, not because they are forced. And we also have consultants. We have a consultant called Priscila from Valley. She lives in Espírito Santo, and she coordinates many consultancy work for Valley, many consultancy jobs for Valley. And she has been sharing this data inside the ARC GIS collector. And so uh, she created everything for us. Colonel? Obviously, it's not public yet, but at a certain moment, we're going to make everything public and available. But if you request to us within the complex, within our operations, and so, you can do it. You can analyze the data. I don't see any problems. So, I have a question. Uh, many people are curious about this regarding the medical problems that the firefighters have been facing. So share this with us. Well, in the first week, I practically didn't sleep because this is extremely complex. The first idea that we had is what is in the, what are the heavy metals in these tailings? Mercury, et cetera, et cetera. So the first time we analyzed, even before 2019, they came to us, we uh, became a little more relaxed. Why? Because we had to pass all of the firefighters through medical exams, medical tests. So all of the firefighters that were in the operation left the operation. They have already done blood tests when they started working there. And the teams that we have there today, they take blood tests at the beginning and when they leave. And so now, what about the other tests? Yes, we had exams that uh, changed. And then a doctors, a team of doctors from the Ministry of Health and also from a hospital in Belo Horizonte and the military police, they came to the following conclusion and we have treatment guidelines and they're going to allow the firefighters to be tested uh, within the next 20 years of their lives. So after doing these tests, he's going to be retested to see if there is an alteration. But the exposure was not acute because we haven't had any cases of military officers showing symptoms that needed to be hospitalized. The, so there were no heavy metals there and they were not impacted and it was not chronic because we didn't have a sequential exposure. And so the limit of 21 days was not established by me. It was established by the medical protocols. So I, I can place them there for 21 days. Otherwise, he's going to be exposed to risk. So the routine tests that had the, the final results altered, they're going to be tested every, every year all the time uh, within the next 20 years. And what about the psychological aspects? The same way, the treatment protocol is not only medical, it's psychological and medical protocols. And so we have a member on our team who is a psychologist. So we have the psychological treatments and analysis. And so, ah, this test is uh, very different. And so the military officer is not only doing the test. The, the military officer is welcomed by the doctor, received by the doctor, and they have psychological follow-up. Diego, I would like to listen uh, from you a little bit more about the technology. So, at the firefighters, did you receive new technology? Did the company, Vali, help you, train you? Because I imagine that after the tragedy, nothing was ready. But from the strategy to the instruments, I would like to listen to you more. How did you acquire the technology that you have been using? One of the main technologies that we are using was the ArcGIS, the creation of maps with many criteria, the creation of several maps, and this was produced by Vali. And so there is a person available to us 24 hours a day helping us to use the ArcGIS software. And there is another person who helps us with maps. And as a consultant, 
we have a geotechnician and she's a consultant. And if we are in doubt about anything, uh, she can help us out with her technical information. When it comes to technology, we try to find this in the market. We try to find the information. We started adjusting the tool that we had as it was possible. So we started in a very rudimentary way, and this rudimentary way was the most important for us, in my opinion. And we created a map on Google Maps, and we started uh, plotting on the map where we found body parts and victims. And then we separated everything into layers. And so we have over 2,500 points, and this is still the main database that we have to do to carry out the operation. And so this is our main tool until now and source of data. If you're watching us on YouTube, we have over 300 people connected, so you can share your questions via hashtag Brazil Digital. I wanted to understand a little bit more. Uh, so how does the headquarters work? So you talked about information for the decision-making process and also the uh, search and rescue mission. So how does this happen on a daily basis? So every day at the headquarters, do you carry out a balance? Do you give feedback about the data? When do you decide to change the models? So uh, how is the day-to-day -day operation of the production and analysis of data? So effectively now, we have, we have the strategies. So I have a kernel there. And this kernel is the strategic connection between us and the operations. And we have the operational bases, base. And daily, every morning, we have a briefing. In the afternoon, we have a briefing with all of the information of everything that is was noticed. And this is shared with the strategy department. So every Thursday, I go there to the headquarters. We have a strategic meeting and we decide, are we going to continue having this strategy or are we going to change it with all the data that is collected? So I have a meeting with these two kernels. Uh, we have advanced in these, these areas. This is our reality today. And then we define, are we going to maintain this or are we going to change our strategy? And so I have about 140 people to keep the operation working. Basically, that's it. Did you understand it? So William, I believe he has a question. So is there preparation so that we can reuse the knowledge, the tools that we acquired and learned in Brumadinho? So I believe that you're going to become a benchmark for this kind of work, right? Unfortunately. So, uh, so uh, are you going to replicate this? Well, we have a huge committee to do a case study. But this case study is only going to take place after the operations are over. But why have we already established who's going to be a member of this committee? Because they have already started uh, taking part in the operations, in the missions, to get to know. So it's continuous learning that we have there. Other Brazilian states, we have taking part in incidents and events. Sorry, we're going to take part in events. It's going to, uh, we're going to take part in the international firefighter event in Ceará. And so the 15 states that were there in Brumadinho with us, they have been asking us to share, but we haven't had enough time to do that. And so the greatest learning is going to be to do as we did in Mariana, carry out a case study, and then go deeper into that. But Brumadinho is not a common a case study because uh, we have several fields of knowledge, several uh, areas, canine units, air, uh, air uh, analysis, aircraft, the logistics, because we had little experience and now we're going to have more experience, so it's going to be a specific study. So we're still constructing this. Wow, now we have many, many questions. 
what is the channel that volunteers have to offer help? And I have already another question regarding the costs of these operations. I know that it's being paid for by the state of Minas Gerais. So what are the channels for volunteers? The channels are the official channels, Facebook, getting in touch. We have an entire structure to receive this in the uh, cooperation department and also at the operations base. So a strategic team is going to get in touch with the professional and then we're going to create the connection. And the other one is costs, the costs. So all of the costs are being paid for by Vale. So everything that we need, everything that we need, and I have been following this up closely since January, everything we need, Vale provides. So we are not having any, we don't have any complaints. We haven't been having problems. They have shared with us drones, machinery, everything, the uh, safety equipment for the firefighters. Thank you. And so now, Francisco is asking if at a certain moment, when you were analyzing the data, did you use variables to identify the bodies, uh, correlation studies with variables, the beginning point, the end point. So he's asking about the specific technique. Mm -hmm. It, the theoretical knowledge regarding our analysis is it's exactly what I'm, I'm uh, calling your attention. We used, uh, well, basically how this map was made. I think this is the interesting uh, point here. We had a point, we had a network of 80 meters, and then we, we had a weight in this point. So it would influence in each uh, part within the map. So it, it was a point in a in a range of 80 meters. So and with a weight, the pay the weight was uh, varying according to the criteria. The points of the map projections that are exactly the final position of victims that had the same initial position as, uh, as the missing ones. The, these points had maximum weight within the heat map. Just to complement, we have seen this work such this, especially regarding the 21 missing uh, people. What are the initial positions in the projection from the moment in which people who were next to them in, in uh, fragments or body parts that would help us locate them? There are other technical questions. If the firefighters used the cell phone signal of the victims and the IT structure for data processing that, that you're using. The first one, we yes, we used the cell phone signals. The first, the, the multi-criteria map, this uh, point had a very uh, high weight, weight. And regarding the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, at the same time, it is simple, it is robust. We had in a devastated location by this, we had the installation of poles that allows us to have internet in most part of the in that uh, tailing um, spot. The IT technology, we don't have a cluster or a supercomputer to work on, on this data. We have several computers and we, they were good, good computers with the ability for all the firefighters in the command, the command post. Okay, we are reaching the end of this panel. I have one more technical question before we, we wrap up. Eric is asking if the models of uh, prediction of fragment positions consider density and size. I think so, right? You made some comments about that. Time, uh, size and density of the fragment and the tailings. Well, yes, we thought of the size of the tailings and the fragment or body, body part. We analyzed it in a specific way. We didn't put it in, put it in numbers, but in the 
analysis of the map segment by segment. We had the register of age segment. It certainly is included when we think of a new strategy or when we elaborate suggestion of guidelines for the command. So where it was found, where this body part was found, the type of body part that was found, all this is in our uh, calculations when we decide the most feasible, interesting uh, guideline in that moment. And just to complement, in the past two months, um, maybe it, this information will help technically in the answer. The civil police changed the classification. What is uh, what we call segment for the body parts? They would uh, they would call segment. We would call fragment. So we we classified by size uh, and diff the hardness, the difficulty to find it. So we can uh, use an equipment called Lumina to be able to identify this, these body parts by DNA. So using these strategies, this work has improved, but it's still hard to identify the body parts. Now, I have a suggestion that it, it is uh, actually a question, but it sounds like a suggestion How about the the availability, the public availability of this data uh, from your research for people that are here and people are watching us on the web, they can they can, they can uh, offer to assist you your work. So, how possible is it to make the, this data available? Yes, we're going to study that. Uh, from next Thursday on, and everything that involves the operations, we can make the data public. Well, this is the end of our time. So thank you very much, uh, Tenet and, and uh, Lieutenant and Cornell. Uh, the ones who are watching you are certainly more proud to be Brazilian, and they are happy to see the all the effort they're doing using that, ana that analysis techniques and, and canine units and all that to help the families who lost their, their beloved ones. Thank you so much. I forgot to mention something in the beginning. We we are still here um, resisting for five years. We will create a Telegram group for the seminar because we don't have a room for people uh, in the WhatsApp group. So we, we're going to generate a QR code for people to enter in this group on Telegram, this new group. I don't know if you saw this, but this year, American Congress published a law demanding in e, uh, the hiring in each agency, American agency, which is equivalent to our ministries, uh, an officer responsible to understand, to analyze, to collect, to make available the information and make information products that are useful for the agency. So it's, it is mandatory in the US for, for every agency uh, to have this professional. And why is that? It is clear in this law, because the US wants to increase the use of information in the management of public policies. Since the development on, until the monitoring to the seed decided things in, with a uh, strong uh, basis. Our guests now, they have this expertise. We will be honored to have the pleasure of the presence of two uh, colleagues who, who come from the Kaiman Lab in Israel regarding uh, data science and behavioral modeling to improve the design of public policies of, of their country. So I'd like to call to the stage Ilan Katsir and Ite Siso.
Ok, agora vocês podem me ouvir. Olá a todos, eu sou o Itai Cisso, eu sou do, do Cayman Labs, eu vou falar com vocês hoje sobre datas, é, dados para o bem. Como podemos melhorar a, as estatísticas com o estudo de comportamento. Eu, eu vou fazer a primeira parte da nossa apresentação, meu colega vai fazer a segunda parte, o Ilan Kaitsir. Quero agradecer muito ao TCU, CGU e ENAP por ter nos convidado para falar aqui. E estamos realmente empolgados em estar aqui. Muito obrigado também aos a bombeiros que falaram antes de nós. Que história fantástica. E vocês tornaram nossa apresentação bem uh, entediante. Mas eu vou tentar fazer uma coisa boa aqui. Vamos começar. Esse aqui é só um roteiro da nossa fala, dividimos em duas partes. A primeira parte eu vou apresentar a Cayman de forma geral. E depois vamos falar sobre o nosso trabalho, o nosso modelo, em mais detalhes. E na segunda parte vamos falar sobre estudos de casos que temos na Cayman com relação a tráfego, educação e cuidados de saúde. Vocês devem estar se perguntando o que é a Cayman. A Kaima é uma empresa privada no, de Israel, da Duke University, com a, associada à Duke University. Nós aplicamos ferramentas estatísticas e comportamento, comportamentais para ajudar a dec, é, decisão, é, tomar decisão e também é, com base em evidências, soluções com base em evidência, e também usamos tecnologia para a nossa experiência e vamos ter um foco muito grande em desenho para as políticas públicas. Nós trabalhamos com os governos, com projetos de, alto, de impacto em larga escala. Vocês podem ver que nós temos uh, atuação em várias, vários campos, como o tráfego, é, minimizar a burocracia é, do governo, e outras coisas. Então, a empresa pode ser dividida em três sessões que trabalham em conjunto. A primeira é a parte de insights comportamentais, que fala sobre as intervenções comportamentais. Isso. E é basicamente isso. Uh, The statistical analysis, the data, pesquisa, uh, and all these kind of things, and the technology and design part uh, in charge of making customized apps, um, websites, whatever is needed uh, to run our experiment and to create our uh, solutions that we go uh, to the customers with. Okay, so Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening my axe, which is to say, invest in your skills and methods. So what I would like to do now is invest a little bit in your skills and methods, hopefully, um, and hopefully it will be taking me less than four hours. Okay, so these are the five stages of our uh, behavioral uh, research uh, process. Um, to present it, I will be using a very simplified hypothetical example. So it's important to keep in mind that this is a hypothetical example, not real research. Um, and later on, as I said, Ilan will present uh, some real example from current ongoing projects in Kaima. So the first stage of our process is the stage that most of you are probably very familiar with, and that's analyzing existing data. So let's assume for the sake of our problem uh, that we have a national problem of obesity we want to tackle, and we have some data from the government. Um, and let's say we analyze this data and we find a negative correlation between uh, education and obesity, okay? So low education predicts obesity to some extent. So there are two problems with these kind of uh, information. First of all, uh, we cannot know from this kind of analysis what leads to what, right? So we cannot know whether it is low education that leads to obesity, or is it obesity that leads to low education, or maybe a third variable that creates uh, both of them. 
Now, the second problem is that even if we uh, had a direction, even let's say that we knew that for some reason, low education leads to obesity, um, then still there are probably more practical ways of treating obesity than by uh, the levels of education, right? So this brings us, well, I, it's important to say at this point that this is a very simplified hypothetical example, but the general ideas hold in more complicated cases, which is finding predictors uh, in existing data. And this is now uh, bringing us to the second stage, which is actively collecting more data. So this can be done by several ways. For example, uh, through other external sources of data. Uh, it could be done by data mining. Uh, but what we often like to do is running surveys that help us uh, get a better grasp of the problem. So let's say, um, for the sake of the example, we ran a survey and we found a positive correlation between uh, fast food consumption and obesity. Furthermore, we found a positive, sorry, a negative correlation between fast food consumption and education, and this correlation explains or mediates the previous correlation we saw between education and obesity. So now we are at a much better state because first of all, we have much better predictors of our problem. Um, and also we can start explaining our previously found uh, correlations. However, we're still left with the problem of what causes what. So it could still be the case that obesity actually leads to greater uh, fast food consumption, right? Or it could be the case, as I said before, that a third variable could cause them both and thus create this correlation that we found. For example, we can think of say, a certain gene that leads to more fat production and also to greater appetite. And this creates the correlation that we see in our data. So in order to find what actually causes obesity, what we need to do is establish a causal relationship. So what is causality? Causality is basically determining the effect of X on Y rather than their mere association. So if you think about it, causality is an extremely important um, concept in evidence-based policy because it answers exactly what we're interested in. And that's what will be the effect on Y if we intervene and change X in the real world, so not in our data. Or in other words, how do we get Y to change in a certain direction by changing something else? Oh, sorry. So Judea Pearl, one of the fathers of causal analysis, writes in his very recent book, causal questions can never be answered from data alone, which is to say statistics alone is not enough. It's never enough. So in order to infer a causal relationship, you either have to uh, have some assumptions in your model, um, which can be given, for example, by domain experts, um, and also you have to use some fancy statistical tools. Or what you could do else is run a randomized control trial. So randomized control trials or RCTs are basically experiments where participants are randomly assigned to either a treatment or a control group. The control group is identical in every way to the treatment group, uh, except that they don't get the actual treatment. So this way, every change we see between these two, um, the, re the results of these two, um, uh, the two uh, conditions can be attributed to the treatment itself and thus establish a causal connection between the treatment and the result that we find. So, James Lind was the first one to try this all the way up in 1747, where he treated uh, ill sailors who had uh, severe vitamin C deficiency, but they didn't know it back then. Um, he randomly assigned them to control or treatment by lemons, and it actually worked. 
Okay, oh, so also important to say, as some of you might know, there are other ways of inferring causality, also from observational data, but we're just not going to go into this uh, right now. Um, RCTs, or randomized control trials, are the gold standard of inferring causality in many fields today, such as medicine, psychology, economics, uh, even design. So A-B testing, you can think of it as a form of an RCT. So back to our chubby guy. So now let's say we have established a causal direction between fast food and obesity. So now we know what causes obesity, at least to a certain extent. Sorry. Um, however, trying to manipulate, trying to lower um, fast food consumption in general can still be very challenging. So what we might want to do at this point is dig a little bit deeper in search of something better to work with. Okay, and this brings us to stage four, identifying the mechanism. So basically the idea in this stage is that we are looking for all the possible explanations that can lead from the cause to the effect, all right? So um, statisticians call these mediators. You can think of these as paths that leads from one, from the cause to the effect. So thinking about our hypothetical uh, example again, um, let's say we can think of three possible explanations of why um, fast food consumption causes obesity. So one explanation would be um, the high number of calories in fast food. The second explanation would be the sugary drinks, soda. And the third explanation is through the fat content. So deep fried food, for example. So now we can look in our data and start ruling out some of the explanations and hopefully we are left with uh, something that mediates the relationship and gives us something uh, to work with. So let's say we're looking in our data and we find that a large number of calories indeed uh, leads to obesity, right? That makes sense. Now, for the sake of the example, let's say we also find that fast food actually doesn't contain more calories than regular food. So we can actually rule that path out. <clears throat> then we see that fast food does indeed um, contain a lot more fat than regular food. Uh, but we also see, again, for the sake of the example, that um, fat content is not a major contributor of obesity, which is a real theory, by the way. So now we are left with a third explanation. So we test it in our data and find that indeed fast food consumption is uh, highly correlated with um, a large amount of soda, of sugary drinks consumption. And this is indeed a major contributor of obesity. So now we have established a whole link between our cause and our effect. And now we have something better to work with. So what we would like to do now is basically try to modify uh, this mechanism or try to block it or um, lessen it in, in some way. So in the behavioral science, we like to think of every action as composed of motivation and friction. So motivation is basically whatever uh, makes you want to do this action, this behavior. And friction is whatever prevents you from doing it or makes it harder to do. So thinking about soda consumption, this is a behavior we want to reduce. So what we are looking for is to increase friction uh, and decrease and or decrease uh, motivation. So there are several ways of doing that. Um, now using this uh, behavioral lens, we can think of uh, classical uh, ways of doing that, such as legislation. So setting rules or banning soda consumption altogether, uh, this would of course add a lot of friction and hopefully reduce uh, soda consumption. Um, this is a somewhat uh, extreme um, result, extreme uh, solution. Uh, but for example, that's what they do in US uh, public schools when they uh, ban selling sugar drinks inside the school. 
So the second uh, possible solution would be um, the classical solutions of economists, and that's through incentives. So for example, we could tax sugary drinks, tax soda, um, soda, soda drinks, and by that also increase the friction and hopefully decrease uh, the soda consumption. However, <clears throat> in behavioral science, we often like to use much more subtle interventions, okay? So these, for example, could be a nudge, okay? A nudge is like a small push, shove in English. So nudges are basically small changes in the environment designed to change people's behavior for these people's own good. So for example, whether to save more for retirement, eat healthier, get more exercise, these kind of things. Um, so here's an example of a visual nudge. Here we can see uh, stairs painted on an escalator. So to tell people what's the correct place to stand on an escalator, so as not to block it for people who are in a hurry. Now, as Brazilians, you might appreciate this next visual nudge, which is designed to help men aim better when they pee in public toilets. So to those of you who can see, this is a small soccer field inside a urinary. Okay, now what I want you to notice here is this very strong connection between um, behavioral science or nudges and design or UX, user experience. So if you think about it, both of them are trying to change um, change the, the environment so as to help people uh, do the correct choice or make it easier to do. So this leads us to stage five, the intervention, or trying to modify or change the mechanism that we just found. Um, so again, we want to reduce uh, solar consumption. So let's say we can think of three possible uh, interventions, three possible treatments. Um, the first one would be to set a small default cup size, right? So default is a, a very common a nudge and setting a smaller um, cup size by default. Um, if you think about it now, using the behavioral language you've just learned is supposed to maybe add some friction because now you have to, if you want to drink more, you have to specifically ask for a larger cup, uh, maybe pay a little bit uh, more for it, um, um, yeah, and maybe go to refill it. These types of things are friction. The second type of treatment we try is giving them a water bottle instead of soda. And again, this is a hypothetical experiment, right? So this allegedly also increases friction because you have to ask, you have to ask to change the soda, the water with soda, if you want to drink soda. Now notice these are very, very subtle. Uh, interventions, subtle treatments, uh, and some of you may think that it doesn't really add friction, so it's not really hard to do, but that's part of the idea in nudges, uh, so not to limit anyone's choice, still leaving anyone with every possible choices and not making it really harder, only a little bit harder, and sometimes this is all it takes to get a significant effect. The third treatment we try is by giving them information. So, for example, telling them the amount of sugar inside their drink uh, printed in bold on their cup. Okay, so let's say we ran an RCT, a randomized control trial, and we test all these three uh, interventions together, of course, with a control group where we can compare all the different uh, treatments to. So now remember again that negative is desirable. We want to reduce uh, sugar drink consumption. So for the sake of our example, let's say that two of the treatments actually worked in reducing consumption. And the third one, the information didn't do anything, which is, by the way, what we and other people often find in this field, that giving people information about what to do is often not enough. So now what we can do is basically pick the treatment that worked the best on average. However, maybe we can do something even a little bit better.
and that's a conditional nudge or conditional intervention. So you could think of this as trying to see whether different interventions worked better on different types of people, different groups of people. So let's say for our example that we find that age moderates both uh, these effects, such as kids react better to the small cup intervention, so they drink less with this type of intervention, whereas adults react better to the water bottle intervention. So what we might do now is um, made, it's make some kind of a tailor-made uh, solution where we decrease the default cup size uh, in children's meals and uh, change the soda with water with uh, adult meals. And this allegedly will get us a better, um, better solution, more efficient solution than a one-size-fits-all um, approach. So to summarize, these are the five steps that I've been mentioning. The first step, analyzing existing data, and the second, actively collecting more data and analyzing it as well. Uh, and you can think of both these steps as answering the question of what predicts our problem. Then, of course, there is uh, inferring causality, but by whatever um, uh, method you choose to do that, and then identifying the mechanism. And you can think of both this question as why do we find these correlations that we found in the first two steps? And then the final stage of finding the solution or testing the behavior change, which could be thought of as an answer to the question of, sorry, how, uh, how do we get people to change their, their behavior and for whom? Now, importantly, technology and design are implemented here all along the way by creating uh, customized uh, experiments, more elaborate experiments, and also using design principles, especially in stage five, to get much stronger, more efficient uh, treatments. So several steps can be performed all at once to save time and money. Some steps can be repeated several times um, until a satisfactory result is achieved. And some projects can start all the way in step five if this is a problem that has been studied before and all we need is to test it and maybe modify it a little bit. But importantly, you can never assume that whatever worked somewhere else in the world will work on your audience as well. So now, uh, Ilan uh, will uh, take it from here. Where are you, Ilan? Um, oh, here you are. So um, you want to come up here? Okay, and I will be back here for questions, so don't move. You have it. Thank you, Itai, and good morning, everyone. My name is Ilan Katsir, and today I'm going to talk about behavioral changes that we have done in our work in Israel. But first, I want to reflect some examples on our own behavior, and I will ask you a few questions. Please be honest. How many of you have ever scheduled an appointment to a doctor and failed to show up? Let's try one more. <laughs> How many of you came here today using public transport? Not that many. So why? Why people schedule up an appointment to their doctor and fail to show up? Why people don't move to public transport? In Kaima, we take this kind of question and answer them using the model that Itai just presented. In the first project I will talk about, I will focus on steps one and two, and how we can cope with difficult problems that we don't have a lot of information on. Now let's talk about traffic. Traffic congestion is a huge problem in Israel and around the world, as you know. And when we approached this problem in Israel, we had almost no information at all about how people move from one place to another. So we had to start from step number two, from actively collecting more data. Let's have a look. Itai, are, are you okay? 
Okay, so in this case, we analyze the big industrial park where lots of people come in. We try to figure out what is the landscape and what kind of things can we do. So in the beginning, we decided to use some drones. We tried to figure out how does the congestion happen and what are the challenges on the way to the high-tech park. We used these live videos in order to validate our data. We wanted to be sure that the data we get is not affected by car accidents and stuff like that. Then we analyzed anonymous cellular data and we saw that there are 85,000 vehicles a day that enter this industrial area. For Israel, it's a lot. <laughs> that most of them are coming for work commute at nine o'clock in the morning. And you can see that nine o'clock in the morning is a really terrible hour. And if we could shift just some of these people's behavior to the left or to the right, we could create a lot of benefit. We also looked on when people leave the industrial area and it's a bit less concentrated, but it's not a good pattern either. And it's getting worse. Almost 84% of the people commute alone by car and only 2% commute by bus. So maybe we thought that all of these people who commute alone by car just do it because they live too far away from their work. But unfortunately, this is not the case. You can see here that 30% of the people live up to five kilometers from the industrial area and still commute alone by car. Five kilometers is not a lot of distance. And if you could change just some of these people's behavior, we could create a lot of benefit. So maybe we should take all of this information, put it on a map and analyze the level of public transportation. And this is exactly what we did. You can see here how we took all of the information that you saw and we basically analyzed what is the potential for changing behavior and moving to public tra transport. The greener dots that you see is where the level of public transportation is really high. And the more yellow dots is where the level of public transportation is worse. When we zoom in, we can find a few interesting things. For example, we can see at different levels of public transportation in the same city, in the same neighborhood. And if you think about it, people pay the same price for their properties and still, and they get a total different level of public transportation. We also can see how many people live next to each other and still commute alone by car. So this analysis gave us, gave us a few ways to think about how we can design a better transportation system. So first, we can offer a carpool match for people who live next to each other and commute to the same workplace. Second, we can offer a shuttles that will take groups of people to the industrial area. And third, after understanding this demand for transportation, we could even create a better bus lines that will take more people to their opportunities. So what we learned from this project? We learned that in complex pro problems like transportation, there is a huge effort needs to be done in order to collect relevant data that will give us more information about the problem. And before doing it, we cannot create a behavioral change and to plan a better transportation system. Nowadays, we're working with the Ministry of Transportation and Ministry of Finance in Israel on creating an innovative data-based public transportation system that will use anonymous cellular data, maybe some drones, and make a, a public transportation analysis in order to understand how we can do together a better transportation system. In the next project, I will focus on steps three, four, and five. And I will try to show you how it's important to run an experiments in order to create an evidence-based policy. So in this case, we're trying to get more young people and especially more young women to study the scientific majors that would allow them to become computer scientists down the way. Every country wants more science technology and Israel is not exception. In Israel, we have less than 25% of women in the high tech sector. So we both try to fix the gender gap and to increase the number of young students who are learning computer science. 
So first, we looked on the process, on the decision environment. And in Israel, we first choose a major in high school, then we choose an academic degree, and then we choose a career. So naturally, we decided to start from where students choose their degree. And in Israel, we have this SAT test, like you have in Brazil, the ENAME test, that students should do before applying to universities. So we said, why not an intervene when these students got their grades and we gave them information about computer science degree? We measured the results and we didn't see any effect at all. When we tried to find out why it was not working, it was really interesting to see that it was too late in the process because girls have an tendency for more human professions already in high school. So they make the actual choice earlier. The next thing we did was to run a survey and to ask young students why are you're not choosing computer science degrees. And the most standard answer we got, it, it's too difficult. And we, saw a, and we saw a big gap between boys and girls answers. So we thought, how we can cope with this difficulty? Luckily, we have in Israel these computer science light courses. You know, these courses that you say, let's give them a light course, and then everybody will choose computer science. And we were even asked to digitize such platform and give it to everybody. We say it's fine, but before digitizing and investing a lot of money and effort, we say, let's run an experiment to check if it really works. So we picked a few classes, we did a before and after evaluation with a control group, and we measured the results. And guess what? It didn't work. And we didn't, believe the, we didn't believe it. So we ran this experiment again, and we saw again the same results. No effect on the boys, and girls were even less likely to choose computer science. When we tried to find out why it was not working, we understood that girls felt that it was unbelievably boring, they didn't get any sense of success, and they didn't understand why it should be their future profession. But we're a stubborn team. We didn't give up. We went all around the country and we filmed young students and especially young women who learn scientific majors and we asked them to tell about their, day, about their daily life at work. For the experiment, we developed a digital platform for choosing a major in high school. In this platform, the students, before they choose their major, they saw our videos. In one of the videos, for example, they saw a young woman who learned computer science and now working in a cool startup, changing the world with more powerful women around her. This girl exactly answered all the barriers that prevent from young girls choosing computer science major in high school. We also use some behavioral principles, like to create an active thinking before choosing the major and also to reduce the present bias by showing them what is the future potential benefits of this profession. Let's have a look, a few, few seconds of how it looked like. So we work with the Minister of Education and we got access to a lot of classes. And you can see here that the students got to use our platform before they're choosing the major. And maybe we're up to something more interesting here. How you can calm down 15 years old teenagers. Just give them cellular phone with our platform. The next thing we did was to perform a causal network analysis to identify the mechanism of choosing a major. Keeping in mind the huge effect of gender on choosing the major twice as much for boys, it was really interesting to find out there is no direct connection of gender to choosing computer science, which means that we managed to explain the whole effect of gender by the other factors in our model. We also can see how central factor is the level of interest is it influences many other factors in our model, such as their self-efficacy that we saw that it was hard for them, that it's difficult, and their, how they see it as their work in their future. 
So what we learned from this project? We learned how hard can it be to infer causality and to identify the mechanism that can give us results. And from analyzing the results of this experiment, we saw that there are 20% more young women who are willing to choose computer science majors. 20% 20, 20 more young students and 30% more young women who are willing to choose more computer science. So what we learn? We learn how hard can it be, and this is why it's so important to run an experiments to check what can work. Here we needed a few experiments. These experiments can really lead us to evidence-based policy and for creating a behavioral change. In the next project I will talk about, I will focus on step number five. In projects where we have a lot of information in academic literature, so we can focus on testing behavior and what can work in our country. The next project is the famous no-show problem. And I'm not talking about dating. In Israel, the no-show rate is about 25%, and it creates huge problems to the healthcare system. A no-show occurs when a patient schedules up an appointment to his doctor and fails to show up, like some of you here. So before we came up, there was this current system that gave people two reminders. The first reminder, five days before the appointment, and the second reminder, three days before the appointment. And the reminder was basically very dry and said, hello, you have, a medical, you have a message regarding your medical appointment. To see the appointment details or unsubscribe from the service, click on the attached link. If I would get it, I won't show up. So we approached the system and we tried to use some alternative text, which, which includes some behavioral principles. So for example, we told them that it's a professional figure message. We told them how much the appointment will cost. We told them that it's a social norm message, that it's a national effort to decrease the no-show. Let's have a look on a few examples and then you will have to vote, so be focused. So the first message is the personal request message that said, hello, this is Ben from the hospital. I wanted to remind you of your scheduled appointment. The second message is the emotional guilt message that said, hello, this is a reminder for a scheduled appointment. And no show without canceling in advance, delete, delete treatment for patients who need medical aid. Let's have one more. The emotional relatives message from the family that said, hello, this is a reminder for a scheduled appointment. Your family will be happy to know that you are taking care of your health. Now I will ask you to vote. Have an opinion. So who thinks the standard message worked the best? You are good. Okay. Who thinks the personal request message worked the best? Okay. Who thinks the emotional guilt message from other patients work the best? Okay, not bad. And who thinks that the emotional message from the family work the best? Itai, what do you think? Just kidding, you know the answer. So the winner is the emotional guilt message, like most of you, raise your hand, so you're, I'm happy. <laughs> that said that a no-show without canceling in advance delays, delays treatment for patients who need medical aid. And I don't know if this type of solidarity message is typical only to Israel. For example, in England, the message that told about the appointment cost worked better. So here in Brazil, maybe something else can work even better. So you just need to try on your local areas. We ran this experiment on about 160,000 patients, and the good news is that all of our messages work better from the standard one. And sometimes we wonder, who designed it? It's so easy to do better. You can see that our winner, the emotional guilt message, 
managed to decrease the no-show rate by about 33%, which helped us to save 400,000 waiting days for the healthcare system. But we didn't stop there. We created a complex AI model that took into account everything we knew about the people. If you remember in the original experiment, we randomly sent different messages to eight groups. Here, we analyzed what kind of people reacts better to which message. And let's have a look on a short example. We have here a 39 years old woman from a middle socioeconomic status with a particular clinical information. It's the, the appointment is 19 days from scheduling and the system observed that she's a chronic no-shower. You can see that our model predicts that the message that will work the best to a person with this specific set of features is the personal request message and not the emotional guilt message that work better on the average people. By training this AI model, we can get up to 40% in no-show reduction. So what we learned from this project? We learned that the vast majority of the work was to send the right message to everyone. And then we could do a bit more by using this AI personalization model. We also learned how we can motivate people, nudge them to change their behavior in a much better way. Let me just summarize with the following. You can see here Dan Aurelis, Professor Dan Aurelis' photo that works with us on all, all of our researchers. And when all of our world becomes more automated and we have more data, it creates huge challenges. But the good news is that we have come a long way from James Lynn's first RCT. We have better tools, so let's use them better. And I really think that behavioral economics and our model can help us do that. It can help us understand how to create attention, what is friction, what motivates people, and how we can redirect their behavior in a much better way. Doing it in the government means we're all committed to better data, better decisions, and better life. Thank you very much. Please, thank you, thank you. That's it. Great. Nós vamos fazer o painel em inglês aqui, então. Okay, very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, I was waiting the Dan Ariely picture, the last slide, okay. Because uh, okay. your boss, I think it's pretty you, important to... You, you want to see him again? <laughs> no, it's not needed. Okay, um, okay. We have a plenty of questions here. And, but first of all, I, I'd like to highlight uh, two sentences you've done, uh, you've speak with us. Uh, Causal questions can never be answered from data alone. And it's pretty important to emphasize that because we are, you know, I don't know, I don't have any time. So I'd like to describe my problem entirely with the data. And unfortunately, I think it's not possible. I think you agree with that. I'd like to, um, you know, ask you to speak a little more about that. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a major problem, and that's the main reason why we rely so heavily on experiments. I think that's part of what makes us uh, different than other, say, uh, consulting companies. If I can compare us to these kind of uh, companies, um, so rely heavily on experiments is probably the best way to go. Um, however, as I mentioned, especially nowadays, um, there are other ways of inferring causality. And, and of course, I, I understand that you can agree that causal connections is what we're interested in. Um, so there are other ways, and the other ways just require you to use more, much more advanced statistics because running experiment is very easy. I mean, you really need very basic uh, statistical skills to compare the conditions. Uh, if you run something much more advanced, um, so you could do better also with observational data, which we actually do as well. I mean, the, the, um, 
the model that Elon showed um, about the education, about what leads what uh, to make people uh, choose a computer science major in high school uh, was done on observational data. Um, so you could do that if you have more fancy statistics and domain experts. So you have to have yeah. some assumptions and th that's also an important part. So that's the part of the, I would say, the, the behavioral insights part in our group. Um, that they are in charge of the behavioral interventions and also the domain experts in its field. So I think that's that's the way to go and uh, yeah. Wait, and Ilan said, we need to invest the time to know better the problem and its impact to public. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you guys have some kind of special training uh, about communication. How could you communicate better with the public servants and with the citizens about uh, it, this kind of job with, you know, um, a lot of inferences, a lot of um, statistics, but how can we, how can you convince your bosses and the public servant to uh, make a try in this case of, in this kind of techniques? So maybe a few words, a few words about it. Uh, when we're working with the government, we see that in, in many places we have really good people. But one of the most challenging places is that the measurement is not widespread enough. The language of measurement yeah. is not there yet. So the first thing that we do in any ministry, we're creating this baseline of data. And when we all, when we all can speak this language of data and evidence-based policies, we can really start to make better interventions, better experiments, and to like to create a better policy for everyone. So the first step is really to understand how we can do a small, like a nudge, but a small change that will help them to map their data better. And in many projects, we start from understanding what is the data that is already there, what we can analyze. Because a lot of government, a lot of ministries, they have a lot of many data points, but they not connecting them together because there are not enough IT persons and data architects in the governments. So this communication, it's really important. It will be based on, of course, on friendship, but also yes. on real data and measurement. So this is what we're trying to do in, in our projects. I think our, we were talking about digital literacy. Um, the need, the, the public servant from, the, from now, not from the future, um, you know, just learn a little bit more data and IT and this kind of stuff, I think. Um, okay, I have a question here from uh, William. Um, he's asking you, well, many of supervised machine learning methods used in industry nowadays has serious ethical pitfalls. Uh, he's talking about data bias. Um, the use of behavioral aspects can help to eliminate or mitigate these pitfalls of data bias, in, in your opinion. Mm, yeah, so what he means by that, I guess that it can create some discrimination uh, where yeah. you just use uh, models. Um, I'm not sure what to say about that. I mean, we don't uh, have any project that we tackled the problem of data bias, did we? Um, I think that the most, what experiments can help in this bias is when you randomize, when you have different groups. What the hell is that? Okay, so when we, when we have randomized control trail and we have the, the like, in the uh, no-show project, we send different messages to different groups of people randomly. So when you're doing that, some of the bias you can you can reduce the bias okay. by already doing it. So uh -huh. yeah. I, I also think maybe, well, I'm not sure, but um, I think data bias problems are more um, prominent where um, you have something, you, you are preventing people from doing something. So for example, law enforcement or uh, encouraging certain uh, groups to, to get education. Um, but what we do is always focused on giving people what they need in order to change their behavior in a way that will do them good. So I think maybe that's why we don't really tackle problems of data bias because, um, yeah, I mean, th this is more, um, more something when you want to prevent uh, people from doing something, I think. Okay. I think. So we can see our Twitter account. 
There's a question uh, from Eric. What is the next frontier for the application of behavioral economics in government? How to overcome the obstacles? Okay, so if we think about uh, the last maybe 300 years, we really have overcome all of our physical limitations. Just look on this auditorium, the lights, the chairs, the table. And I really think that in, in this year, what we are trying to do in Kaima is to overcome the cognitive limitations and how people, this, how people uh, make choices, how we can redirect their behavior. And I think that the next thing that we could do is focus on how we can create technologies that will build from scratch on behavioral economics principles. So for example, we got this computer science, how we, we wanted to get more young girls to choose computer science. The current system is not built on, on these principles. So first we try to, to try some existing technologies and it's really hard. Then we needed to create our own platform that was built that was built from scratch on our principles, on what we learned in our research, or the obstacles and motivations that we found. So if we can create these technologies from the beginning on our principles, I think that it really can help. And I really think that this is one point where we need to go. And maybe the other is to understand how we can scale these solutions. Because, okay, you can create an application, it, it, will, it will work really good, but now you need to implement it for thousands, hundreds of thousands of students in many other systems in Ministry of Education. So it's a huge problem and we need to think from the beginning on solutions that are scalable. Mm -hmm. in, in Itai's vision, when we presented our vision, we always think not if something is uh, only behavioral, we also think if we can scale and implement the solution. So if a law needs to be changed, we won't go in this direction. We'll try to go on ways that it's more easier also for the government to implement. So I think it's the next stage. Yeah, even for that, um, a question. Did you do a follow-up of the young, uh, young women in computer science careers Just trying to you know, convince the bosses that, oh, okay, she picked the right course and she's a very successful uh, computer science right now? Did you pick this, these numbers? Of the so are you asking whether we had a follow up on this? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, the, yeah, so we didn't want to maybe tell about can, it? yeah, the experiment is uh, we finished the experiment recently. Okay. So these Not, the girls, uh, they are still young girls. They are in their eleventh grade. Ah. So, but uh, it's a good question because in many of our experiments we do like the after measurement. Like in transportation, we try to uh, we check if if we give people personal commuting plan. Mm -hmm will give them like the exact information when they need it on their uh, on their possible route we wanted to check if they will change their behavior so then we measure the effect half a year after the experiment and we still saw the effect so it's a really important direction that we need to do the measurements also after the and, experiment and we did it in uh, in this experiment uh, three months after it only we had a much smaller sample because not everyone uh, was answering this was sent to them through their uh, cellular phones it was nine thousand students at the beginning but then the final stage was only one thousand students and we still saw an increase uh, with the group that was assigned to the the treatment the ones who saw the videos but it was uh, much smaller so um, it could be the much um, lower statistical power, but also what we think is that this effect dissipates. So it's important to give them this information right before they are making yeah. the choice. Otherwise, you lose the effect. That's what kind of what we yeah. see. And the next step would be um, to run an experiment where they choose their actual uh, choice um, and just after they see the movie. So that's the next step. I think your answer is related to the next question. How open are Israeli public officials to experiment with behavioral knowledge? What do you attribute this to? We are talking about culture right now, I think. So, so it, it was not easy, but now I think they're really open because oh, yeah? Yeah, uh, we're working more like three years with the government and in many fields like Itai showed to you earlier, transportation and health and digital literacy. And we're working in huge project on reducing bureaucratic burden on how we can take a really huge processes and to build them from the beginning on behavioral 
uh, aspects. So they're really open. We have a lot of collaborations uh, in Israel and like starting a lot of them around the world. So we hope we can do good uh, everywhere we, we are. So okay. really open. <laughs> okay. Not, uh, not ask for, for more. Okay. Oh, well, you guys will just give us a pleasure to a workshop on Wednesday from 8 to 12 in two days called Bring Your Challenge. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you to speak a little more about this workshop on Wednesday, if you, if you can. Well, <laughs> I think, um, no, that's, um, yeah, the, the idea there, first of all, I think don't come with such high expectations. We cannot like <laughs> solve any problem. Like, I don't know, I have problems with my relationship, what I do. My wife is not doing this and that. No, it's 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 really it's difficult. I think what the most of what can we bring, and maybe I'm biased here, is that the work method that can lead you to the correct results. Uh, how can you get to them? And maybe some some behavioral insights that uh, we can give that help it. But um, do you think yeah, maybe? Else? Uh, it's really important to come like with these questions and maybe yeah. to think on what is the current behavior. What is the behavior that you want to change? What is the data that you already have? What is the data that you think that you need to collect? So maybe think about the five steps that you saw here and it will help you to get better questions that can really redirect people's behavior. Yeah, and, and importantly, this is, this is a long process. I mean, think yes. people often think, okay, nudges are really small um, things that you make in the environment, so it's easy. It's maybe easy to implement and uh, cheap, but it's expensive to, to study. So you need thousands of participants, you need to invest, you need a lot of knowledge. Um, so, so this process takes time. Um, yeah, and, and in Israel, um, one of the nice uh, thing we had, uh, it's called the Najathon, which is basically um, several teams uh, from, from different uh, parts of the, the government, uh, which came all to a big, whole kind of like this, only like flat with, with tables. Okay. And there was uh, some uh, high ranking academic professor which uh, went between the tables and helped them. And, e and each team had um, like two people from academics and uh, other people from the government. And each team tried to solve a certain problem and they followed up on it uh, several months uh, after that. And I think that's, that's a good uh, way, first of all, to connect between academia and, and government. Um, and also to try, uh, yeah, solving problems in a larger scale. Um, I think it's a good initiative, and and I, I've heard that you're actually considering to do that here in Brazil as well. So maybe you can help with that. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any time. Three three minutes more. Uh, question from Fabiano. Which are the main artificial intelligence techniques have you been used in your projects? Mm. So actually, um, what we currently do is, we, I, I wouldn't call it artificial intelligence. I mean, we, we use more basic statistical techniques. So the power comes from the randomized control trials, the experiments, uh, things like that. Um, we are getting into more big data machine learning uh, approaches now. But um, what we, I would say the, the, the most uh, maybe cutting edge uh, techniques that we use um, are some things that maybe uh, data scientists are less familiar with and maybe mm -hmm. uh, social scientists are more familiar with. That's the field that I'm coming from, such as uh, structural equation modeling. This helps you uh, get the whole uh, mechanism that I uh, shown is, is more uh, important and not just try to predict the problem. That's, that's probably the main problem I would say with, with uh, machine learning techniques, which are awesome at doing a lot of things, you know, beat the best player in the world, uh, the best Go player or chess player. Uh, but for our specific applications, uh, which is uh, evidence-based policy, where you have to establish causality, you need to go deeper and find the mechanism and, and use things like uh, causal analysis, network analysis, um, structural equation modeling, things like that. I'm sorry, running out of time. Um, let's see our last questions. Uh, 
uh, bias on behaviors? I think we've picked this question. Um, is there any data protection law in Israel? If so, how is the consent for data collections without invading professional private deprivations? Yeah, we have a really, pri privacy laws are really hard in Israel. And this is why I'm trying to show like in transportation, all the data that we analyze was anonymous. So, and when you think about it, you don't really need the data that it, which is not anonymized. You need to understand behavior of groups of people and how you can effect, create a large impact on large groups. So if you think about transportation or no-show that you are doing a large experiments, you want to understand what is the change on groups of people. This is why it's, we can work with the privacy laws. We just ask the, the companies that we work with, like it's large transportation companies, to take out all of the user information and just give us data points. And the data points we even can work with, you know, up to 250 meters that nobody can tell that we can yeah. refer to someone specific. So this is a really important po uh, point and we're really trying to care, take care of it and not to get any data that we don't need to for our research. Great. The last, um, how to learn more about behavior economics? I, uh, I you, know you, a, you, you a can, great you, book. You, you can call it I. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, well, there are actually amazing books today. So. Uh, this is funny, maybe, I don't know if it's relevant, but I, I came to this field from a very relevant field. I studied my master's and best bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering, and then I came to behavioral economics <laughs> in my PhD. So obviously you can learn that later in life, and uh, there are really great books. Some of them by Dan Ariely, I should say, <laughs> of course. He's, he's our boss. But, yeah. <laughs> but there are very, uh, very good uh, other books, uh, so for example, I would say Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is maybe the most uh, Daniel uh, inclusive. Yeah, Daniel Kahneman. Um, behavioral economics, actually, um, there is the book called Nudge uh, by uh, yeah. Sunstein and Thaler, um, which is also very good and very focused on, on what we talked about today. And I mean, I probably read all these books, so I can recommend uh, a lot of them. But uh, yeah, Free Economics is a very good yeah. book. Yeah, all the series. Or predictably rational, right. maybe. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I said all of Dan's book. That's actually what got me into this field, Dan Ariely's books. So. Great. So I'd like to thank you very much, guys. I'd like to inform you that the soccer field is not a nudge for us anymore because <laughs> our team is not so good. As uh, that's not right. But, um, <laughs> I'd, like to, Israel. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank you very much. Obrigado a todos vocês. I will um, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You guys are amazing. 14. Horário de volta, 14 horas, nesse mesmo local. Muito obrigado. Food trucks prontos. So we will be back here at 2 p.m. Okay, the food trucks are ready for you. See you uh, at 2 p.m.